I'm sure there are some of you that are saying, you're just a little late on this, aren't you? And yes, I am. And there's a good reason for that is Friday, I was sitting there and having switching internet providers and having them come to install, which by the way, since I had to switch to Xfinity or Comcast, you know the shit didn't go right. And I had internet trouble all weekend up to and including when I was trying to watch Backlash France, the fucking shit kept going down on Saturday. The shit didn't work right until Sunday when another tech had to come in. It was a whole hellabaloo. Like, those of you that are Comcast customers, you probably know what the fuck I'm talking about. Um, but as I was clearing out the cable box, uh, apparently I got into some poison ivy or something. And maybe I'll post a picture on Twitter. But my, like, right eye was completely swollen shut. I had to go to the ER Sunday morning. So, yeah, my bad. I haven't been on camera the past few days because... Yeah, I was looking kind of rough, and I still don't look great. I've got, like, rash on my arm and stuff. But the, the face, at least I kind of look like I normally do now, and I'm not sitting there like this. That's literally how I looked, all red and puffy and swollen up on uh, Sunday morning. So my apologies for the delays, but let's get to it. Let's talk about Backlash France, and oh, yes, most importantly of all, fuck Comcast. Um, This is probably going to be a thing for the WWE every year going forward is that the pay-per-view, the excuse me, the premium live event after WrestleMania is going to be international. And it's hard to argue with them to say that they shouldn't do it. Last year, obviously, the show in Puerto Rico was a huge success. And this show in Lyon, France, was obviously a massive success for them from a box office standpoint. The ambiance and the environment of the show, you know, to have a crowd that was that engaged and that involved throughout the entire event it really adds to the viewing experience. Now, I will say, I'm not just going to be overwhelming in my praise because and maybe this is like an international or soccer type of fucking thing, but I'm all for like the crowd. Like if you're paying money, go there and have a good fucking time. Don't sit on your damn hands. It's really stupid. Um, but when you're talking about wrestling, you know, at some point in time, tie your reaction, tie what you're doing to what's going on and don't go into business for yourself. And that's kind of what I felt like you were getting as you were going through the night, to the point where it did kind of get a little annoying, but just the overall vibe and the energy was still really awesome. They announced reportedly that this was a record-breaking um, live event gate record in terms of an arena show. And that state, that arena only holds like 11, what, 11,000, maybe 11,500 people? Golly, that means you did like $4 million gate or so on an $11,000 house. So you're charging 300, 350, 400 bucks a fucking ticket. If you could actually con these French fucks into doing that, why wouldn't you do a show there every single year? Holy Christ. I mean, now to me, in honor of the location that you were in, you were in France, you should have, you should have called the event something like unconditional surrender. It would have been appropriate. Like, we surrender, we, we, we surrender. Oh, here comes the French contingent with their flaming keyboard fingers of fire. Oh, 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 how do you say that? We will quit those in WW2. Don't you sit there and talk shit about the Vichy government. <laughs> Anyways, fuck it, I'm taking too much time, sorry. Um, let's talk about this show. The opening match, I just got off to a hot start. You've got... Solo and Tonga against Orton and Kevin Owens. And, you know, when you have Nick Aldis come out and basically announce that it's an anything goes match, it's a street fight, like the guys are already starting off Helter Skelter before he even comes out. Like, this is perfect, right? Not every match should start off as a fucking regular standard match. Like, if there's that type of heat, there's that type of friction, let it go. Let it show, right? Different matches should feel different. Different matches should start different. This was good. It was good. Obviously, you know, you had a lot of fans, I think, before the event were speculating that it was going to be Jacob Fatu that would join the bloodline. And instead, it was Tongaloa. Some of you are like, Camacho? They're actually embracing his real heritage? Yeah, I know, right? Uh, Vince isn't here anymore, so <laughs> they're not doing that dumb shit. Uh, but this match was fine. I thought it was good. Uh, Bloodline wins. Solo wins, which you had to do here, right? And the whole time I'm sitting there and I'm like, man, when Roman and Jimmy and Jay 
get aligned again whenever Roman comes back. They're going to be massive fucking baby faces. Roman's going to be over like a million bucks as a face. Holy shit. I'm just... Mm, mm. Like, can we really buy Solo in that role? Is, 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 this, is this where we're at? Do we really buy him as that level of guy? Oof. The only other thing I would say here is if you're really trying to put over Solo, you know, did you need to bring out Tongaloa to help him win? Maybe just have, and, and, and this is something that bothers me sometimes about wrestling, is that not everything has to be bullshit or hook or crook, especially if you're trying to present somebody as a heel. Sometimes people and characters can be really hateable because they're really fucking good at what they're doing. They're dominant. Like you want to pay money, you want to watch for somebody to beat them. And not always because they're doing shysty, shady, cheating, getting help and assistance shit, right? And especially if you're trying to establish Solo as a legitimate threat, it's not going to hurt Kevin Owens and Randy Orton to lose this match. Have them fucking lose clean. I know it's a street fight, and so it's not against the rules or anything, but don't have them get help, right? Just don't do it. Anyways, that's a small critique. Um, yeah, the triple threat match for the women's championship, I historically, for those that watch, know, you know that I'm really not a fan of triple threat matches, but this was pretty good. Crowd was obviously really into it. You know, for those that have been pumping up Tiffany Stratton, uh, saying that she's going to be a big deal. Yeah, I could see that out of this match, right? Um, Naomi, always gorgeous, and Bailey getting her shine as the women's champion, and she's worked hard over the years. She deserves it, right? A good match. Um, but you know, as I'm watching this stuff, like I watch this triple threat match and it's kind of one of those things where I'm like, most of the belts aren't going to change hands. <clears throat> There's only five or six matches. They're all going to get a ton of time. This really feels like an international house show, not like a premium live event, not like a pay-per-view. That's kind of what I thought. Um, which, you know, <laughs> you think about it. You had your next match was Damian Priest defeating Jey Uso for the World Heavyweight Championship to retain. And man, I tell you, before the bell rings, Jey Uso is over. And with this Lyon, France crowd, he was really, really, really over. Really over. And then the bell rings. And he's just kind of, eh. And to those that might say, well, you know, what are you saying? Some of your favorites of all time weren't exactly like absolute work rate monsters in the ring. You're absolutely right. But a lot of them knew how to maximize what they had. And a lot of them knew how to tell really good stories. As a singles wrestler, if it's not against Roman, it's just really not there with Jay. Like main event Jey Uso eating all that other shit. The crowd really loves him. But when the bell rings, it's just kind of blah. So it was hard for me to jive and get with this match. Because the whole time I'm waiting for it to really pick up. And it just never does. And the other thing that seems pretty obvious at this point is it sure seems like they're pointing towards a Judgment Day split or at a minimum, a Damian Priest face turn. And you know what, especially if you're gonna send Drew McIntyre at him at some point, that's probably the direction you need to go. Um, it feels like that's where we're getting to. That feels like where we're coming to at this point. Um, I do wanna know, by the way, who in the fuck decided to give a match with Jade Cargill and Bianca Belair almost 18 minutes? Like, no disrespect to the Kabuki Warriors, but Bianca and Jade, if they're winning this match, it shouldn't take 17 and a half minutes for them to fucking get the job done. That's really stupid. You should be booking those two beautiful black goddesses as fucking dominant on stuff of forces, not struggling to beat fucking Asuka and Kari Sane. I don't care if it's a fucking title match or not. 
Like you should be building these two up as this monstrous unstoppable tag team force to where, where the black bitches explode and now you get to their big money match at WrestleMania. Like who's going to stop them? The only thing that can stop themselves is each other. And instead they're struggling to win a 17 minute match. And what you're doing is you're fucking exposing Jade. And she's got tremendous presence. She's fucking gorgeous. She's got an amazing body. Like all these other positive things I could spew upon her. But she's still pretty green as goose shit. And we know this. And you should be looking for ways to accentuate her positives and avoid, hide, mask her negatives. And then you keep putting these long matches out there. You're just doing the opposite of what the fuck you should be doing. Like not every match needs to go a really long time. Not every match needs to be a competitive 50-50 fucking back and forth battle. And I know Jade's going to get a lot of shit here for this match, even with that great sequence that she had with her finisher. That was fantastic. They're going to be talking about, oh, this looks slow and sloppy and shit. It wasn't just Jade, it was the other ladies. Because this shit wasn't tight, because you booked it to go way too fucking long. Just because you can go 17 and a half minutes doesn't mean you should. Go seven. Put another match on the card if you want. Like, we got two nights of fucking WrestleMania, but the next month you come back for Backlash France, you only got five matches on the card. I I just don't get that one. But Bianca and Jade win. It was the one title change you could feel really coming. But hey, sometimes that's okay, right? Because you could see it coming because it's absolutely the right freaking decision for business. That said, having them go almost 18 minutes was really, really, really dumb. And whoever was the agent for this, whoever made the call for this match to go that long, needs to have their head examined, frankly. And then we get to the main event, and it's Cody Rhodes and AJ Styles. I think this is a perfect example to me of two guys that you know are going to work really well together. Two guys that you feel like, especially if you're there in person and you want to see a really good kind of like main event wrestling match, you're going to see it. But I'm still, you know, saying now Cody's champion, now what? And this is a match, admittedly, you have absolutely no thought that AJ Styles is going to bit win or can beat him here. All you're doing is waiting for either a Roman or a Rock to come back. And I don't even mean disrespect to AJ Styles, because I respect AJ Styles. You know, I've always been a fan of his to some degree, right? Especially going back to the TNA days. But, you know, this feels like Daniel Bryan winning at WrestleMania 30, and then his first title feud is against Kane. Mm. <clears throat> WrestleMania 40, Cody Rhodes, it's the big thing, and now his first feud's against, no disrespect, AJ Styles? You go from doing business with Roman Reigns and The Rock to AJ Styles? Yeah, shit. That's going to feel like a big step down. You know, especially if they're going to keep this belt on Cody for a while. He's got to be better and they got to do better with him. Because it's exactly what the fuck I feared a little bit. It's the finish the story. Okay, now what? Good main event. I'm not going to say it wasn't a good main event. Did it need to go almost a half hour? Probably not. Whatever. I can remember Triple H is in charge now, so he likes his fucking long ass matches. Um, like I said, this was okay. It was a, it was a solid show. Um, ripping the folks off, charging them 300 fucking plus, plus bucks on average a ticket. Good Lord, maybe almost $400. Woo, that's crazy, man. For a glorified house show. That's exactly what the fuck this was, folks. This was a glorified house show. You made a little history because referee Jessica Carr was the first female referee um, to ref a world championship main event. Cool, right? Like, you had some good stuff here, but, um, man, I hope the French crowd got what they paid for or felt happy with it. Because, god damn, I couldn't imagine paying 400 bucks to go to this show. Golly. Uh, 